With how big of a franchise SpongeBob SquarePants is, you can expect there to be a ton of fan-made content. Fan-made Flash games are common for almost every children's show, but sadly, there is a dark side to them. If you went on any Flash game website throughout the 2000s, or even today, you would see advertisements for highly disturbing fan games featuring Spongebob or other fictional characters. These were marketed toward children and often used characters and media kids were more likely to be drawn to. On YouTube, a similar phenomenon has been referred to as Elsagate, since the character Elsa from Frozen is often the subject of videos with similar themes. Both the games and the videos were aimed toward children, but filled with inappropriate imagery and disturbing themes. For years, if you were looking for Spongebob fan games, you were likely to stumble across one of these. We looked at some of them in our last video, but would you believe I actually left out some of the more especially disgusting ones? I might be just a little scarred from some of the things I saw during my research. But today, I'm here to help cleanse the filth of the garbage we've just witnessed. If you were to look past the many doctor and dentist games Flash websites would constantly hit you with, you had the chance to strike gold. Some SpongeBob Flash games were both fun to play as a kid and fun to go back to as an adult. Let's look at some of them and remind ourselves there was a yellow spongy light at the end of the dark tunnel of teeth and surgery. This first one is one I have many fond memories with. It's called SpongeBob SquarePants RPG. I'll start by playing the music for you. Now that is beautiful. This music has stuck in the back of my mind for years. It sounds so nostalgic and gives you a bittersweet feeling as you play. This even had my five-year-old self feeling nostalgic. What did I even have to be nostalgic for? Teletubbies? This was made by the developer Rufus in 2003. Just this past month, they actually gave us a little update on this game's development. The song was an example track on a software that is thought to be Fruity Loops, but Rufus's friend Santa King remixed it and created what we hear now. While the developer has moved on to bigger and better things, they have expressed interest in updating it. I think that would be amazing, because this game is really impressive for the time it came out. Let's get into it. First of all, just look at the detail. We can see all the items we need to get in the future as well as our stats. Health, armor, knowledge, strength, all the usual good stuff. You can sleep in your bed to pass the day and regenerate. That's right, this game has a day-to-day -day cycle. You also have a limited amount of money, so spend wisely. When you go outside, you can ride your seahorse throughout the town. You can go into some buildings such as the Chum Bucket, which Plankton has apparently rebranded into a supply shop. Hey, this kind of foreshadowed that one episode. You can buy stuff from him, but you can also work for him and make money. I guess Mr. Krabs is fine with Spongebob helping his rival if he isn't selling food anymore. You can go to the gym and work out too. This improves your strength, which you'll need, but it exhausts you and you have to go home and rest. If you head to Squidward's house, you can use his bookshelf to study, and yeah, Sandy's here for some reason. She's here every passing day, too. She's just squatting in Squidward's home. It's also funny how you need to use Squidward's shelf to study when Spongebob has a whole library of his own. But he also borrows Squidward's toothpaste, so he's just that kind of neighbor. If you head to Patrick's house, you find that he has a store of his own. Everyone has a shop in Bikini Bottom now. He's selling your karate gear that you can use for combat, so I guess Spongebob gave it to him. I don't think the lore was a high priority when they developed this. I also love how their mouths move during cutscenes. They're saying all that stuff really fast and repeatedly. Hey Patrick, I would like to buy my armor back. Oh, the armor you gave me a sell? Yeah, I changed my mind, give it back. So now let's head to the Krusty Krab. Here you can eat a Krabby Patty to raise your charm. I guess they really are made with love. Talking to Mr. Krabs will send you on a mission. He has some small jobs for Spongebob to take care of. What shady business has old Eugene gotten up to? This could basically be considered the main story of the game. There were meant to be more episodes, but the developer never got around to making them. For the first mission, Mr. Krabs says he borrowed Patrick some stuff to help him set up his store. I remember thinking this way of phrasing was kind of strange. When you go to get the stuff back from Patrick, Spongebob repeatedly uses the same term. Nothing else in this game or on the developer's profile is strangely worded, so this dialogue kind of stands out. It would have been better to have said he lent you some stuff. For your next mission, you have to fight the guy who dumped Mr. Krabs' daughter. His name is Johnny with one N, but he's actually the fish in the show who's frequently named Tom. Or Incidental Six. To fight him, you need a fighting license from Plankton. Kinda funny how Mr. Krabs directly sends you to his rival. They really have patched things up. 
I love how you can just outright buy a fighting license without having to go through any screening process or anything like that. Then again, Plankton is evil and probably doesn't care. Not sure why the license already had Spongebob's picture on it, though. Was it on reserve for him? Spongebob knew one day he would have to fight, so he called in advance. So this leads to our combat portion of the game. You repeatedly click to fight back and try to hit your opponent more than he can hit you. If your strength is up, this fight shouldn't be too hard. For your next mission, Mr. Krabs wants Sandy to work for him, but she only listens to smart people, so you need to read Squidward's books and convince her. She also says she's in Squidward's house to study his books, so I guess we have a reason for her squatting. Imagine spending weeks at your friend's house just to read their books. What's funny is how Spongebob tells Sandy that working for Mr. Krabs would improve the economy. This shows that he's smart enough for her to listen. I mean, it's realistic. People always talk about the economy to make themselves sound smart. Now we've reached the mission that gave me the hardest time both as a kid and even as an adult. Plankton owes Mr. Krabs money and you need to fight him. I bet he regrets giving you that fighting license now. Plankton beats you to death with a clarinet and he's really hard to outdo. Now here's my biggest issue with this game. When you die, it's game over and you have to start from the very beginning. All the progress you've made is erased and you have to start all over again. This game is cruel. Because of this, I was never able to beat Plankton as a kid. And to be honest, I still can't beat him. But thanks to the power of the internet, I was able to find out what happens next. If you grind hard enough, you can outpace him and win. Then you're on to the last mission. Mr. Krabs' daughter Pearl is looking for a new boyfriend since you killed Johnny with one N. But she's been going to a dangerous club and you need to get her out of there. You trade Squidward his clarinet for a club card and he somehow has one with your information on it. Okay, what's the explanation behind that? So you give Pearl a diamond to convince her to leave the club, then you win. The only thing left to check out is this secret jellyfish minigame. You're on a snowboard and you have to collect jellyfish while avoiding the many Gary clones. It's interesting just kind of random. Not bad. Overall, this is a good fan game. Impossible boss fight aside, it's really well made and you have to appreciate the passion that went into it. I can tell the developer cared about it and wanted to make a legitimate game here. Also, you can't deny the music is great. One of the best things about this game. So let's move on to another Flash game from the 2000s that many of us will fondly remember. This one's called Spongebob Saw Game. Remember those old YouTube videos of Spongebob characters getting out of traps from the Saw movies? Yeah, this is nothing like that. This is actually a very kid-friendly version of Saw. Impressive, I know. This was made by Inca Games, who many of us who grew up on the internet might recognize. They had a massive line of games based on the Saw movies, often using celebrities or fictional characters. Now wait, don't walk away just yet. This isn't another ElsaGate situation, I swear. The games were actually decent and had legitimate effort put into them. The dialogue was often clever and these didn't seem like mass-produced, low-quality creations. So let's see what they had to offer us with Spongebob. You can either play in English or Spanish, which is a nice feature. Though many of these games were made in Spanish, the English is actually really good. So the plot is similar to the wrong side story in Operation Krabby Patty. Spongebob wakes up one morning to find Gary has gone missing. And I have no idea what that's supposed to be on the windowsill. It looks like the Babadook's fingers, but you never find out. Plankton appears on your TV, but he's quickly pushed aside by the Jigsaw Killer. Oh, sorry, I meant Pigsaw, as he's called in these games. Also, Amanda is with him in her pig mask. I guess that's where the name comes from. You have different dialogue options, but they don't really change much. They just give you extra scenes. The dialogue here is actually really clever and amusing to watch. SpongeBob is just as sassy here as he is in the AWE games. I know I keep referencing them, but they came out around the same time as these, so it fits with the theme. Basically, Pigsaw wants to cook Gary, and he's giving you the chance to save him by going into his castle that apparently has Dish Network. Pigsaw doesn't really have a motivation for putting you through this, he only does it for the sake of the plot. Either way, this kicks off a point-and-click adventure where you look around for different things to help you reach Pigsaw's castle. The background music is also taken from Battle for Bikini Bottom, which is a nice touch. With people and objects, you have the option to either talk to them, interact with them, or look at them. Kind of like in Sam and Max Hit the Road. You go around the house collecting stuff and solving puzzles to unlock your own front door. I think Pigsaw might have set this up, because if not, Spongebob sure has a complicated process for the simple act of leaving the house. He also has the Flying Dutchman's dining sock for some reason. Outside, you find a map that can teleport you all throughout Bikini Bottom. You can't do a lot just yet, but the story picks up at the Krusty Krab. Squidward needs to make a delivery, but he left his bike at home. However, his front door key was stolen by Patrick, who thinks it's an action figure. You give him an actual action figure to get the key back. That's oddly in character. Good job. 
Now, Squidward's bike is the first really confusing obstacle. It's broken and you have to fix it, but it's tough to figure out exactly how to do so. You find various tools and mechanical parts, but none of them will work on it. You might even think the game is bugging out, but be patient, we'll be able to solve this later. So when you speak to Mr. Krabs, you learn that he's sad because he lost his nose. Nah, actually he lost his first dollar. He suspects Plankton stole it, which turns out to be true, but he's away helping Pigsaw. His wife, oh sorry, I meant his assistant, Karen, will gladly give it to you, but she runs out of battery life before she can. This means you have to recharge it. Before we do that, let's visit the Flying Dutchman ship. Here, you can find a whole bunch of mechanical parts that you can use for different things later. The game also teases you by giving you a medallion that you supposedly have to open a chest with, but it's too small. There's an equally sized doubloon on the steering wheel after you give the Dutchman his sock and use a crowbar to pry it off, but it doesn't work either. Now they're just messing with you. You actually use it to pay this guy to give you a boat ride to Pigsaw's castle. You can come and go as you please, so I guess one single payment was enough for him. So the tough guard from the Salty Spittoon won't let you win unless you prove you're tough enough to enter. You have some funny dialogue options, but they don't do anything. Let's come back later. For now, let's solve this dreaded bike debacle. By heading to Jellyfish Fields and using the right combination of items, you can charge Karen's battery with a jellyfish to get Mr. Krabs' dollar back. This'll cause his nose to grow back so he'll leave the office and you can steal his fan. Then you disassemble it and you can use its propeller to replace one of the wheels on the bike. Then Squidward goes off to make his deliveries, allowing you to reach the customer candy jar which you can use as a water helmet to enter Sandy's tree dome. Only after reconstructing her front door handle in an overly complicated fashion. Also, for some reason, they always refer to Krabby Patties with a C instead of a K. Might be a translation error. In Sandy's Tree Dome, you can get inflatable anchor arms like the ones from the show, but I have to wonder why Sandy has these. She seemed pretty against the whole idea of them in the episode. Could Sandy be... a fraud? Someone make a video essay about that. This is some incriminating evidence. The anchor arms terrify the guard and make him run away, letting you enter the castle after solving a really unique puzzle. It isn't too challenging, but the way you solve it is intriguing. Once you get inside, you're immediately obliterated by King Neptune and the game is over. Wow, great game. 10 out of 10. Nah, there's actually a really complicated process to survive him. On the Flying Dutchman's ship, you have this obscure puzzle where you shine a light through a picture of him. Then you place the medallion on the picture and it opens the chest you couldn't open before. I will say, that was a little too out there. These point-and-click escape games just wouldn't be the same without at least one puzzle that absolutely no one could solve without a walkthrough. In the chest, you find the Chaos Emeralds and a bunch of other things. You can then construct a shield to defend yourself with, but it isn't strong enough until you add this tiny little shell to the top of it. That somehow makes it powerful enough to deflect the blast and turn King Neptune into a seahorse. Funny how that works. Now you get to move through the castle and solve clever puzzles along the way. A colored stopwatch will tell you what order to place the Chaos Emeralds in in a few slots to open a door, and a poem you got earlier will tell you what order you can press these buttons in. It's a little hard to deduce because the last two phrases don't really tell you which of the first two they're referring to, but once you figure it out, you get to mess with the contraption. You toy around with the gear and belt to make the device move in different directions so you can get the key and open the door. It's easy to figure out, but still clever. Then you get an even more complicated puzzle where you have to kick these big box things in the right order to slide them into the correct spaces. This is a legitimate thought exercise, and while I like it, it does kind of come out of nowhere. Nothing else in this game is anything like this. Kind of cruel to throw something as complicated as this at the player this close to the end of the game. But once you figure that out, you have yet another puzzle to complete. Jeez, how many levels of security does Pigsaw need? Does his castle have any normal rooms, or does he just live in a series of complicated passages that require certain levels of strategy to navigate? This one's clever because you use a wrecking ball to break a wall, then an anchor for this guard to hit his head into. Ouch, that's kind of brutal. He hit himself so hard he faded out of existence. And finally, you reach the room where Plankton is with Gary in a robot suit. Once you start the puzzle, you only have three seconds to complete it, so make sure you know what you're doing. Once you figure it out, you electrocute Plankton and save the day. Just as you're leaving, Gary sees a robot girl snail and chases after her. She's being controlled by Pigsaw, and it's implied there will be a sequel, but we never got one. I've come to expect things like this by now, but you can actually enter your name to submit your score at the end. Interesting, but not necessary. 
This one's good. Not perfect, but let's be honest, no point-and-click escape game is. At the same time, it's creative, the dialogue is charming, and I have to commend them for managing to make a kid-friendly version of Saw. Didn't think it would be possible. So let's look at one more Spongebob fan game before we close out. I didn't actually grow up with this one, but it's really popular, and I'm sure many others have fond memories of their own with it. It's called Doodle Bob and the Magic Pencil. No, not Golden Doodle Bob. Grace will have to sit this video out. This was made by Techno Super Guy, also known as Ethan Wake. It was originally made in 2008 as a Christmas gift for his brother. It was based on the episode Franken Doodle and used both elements and voice clips from it. In 2019, the game was remade with better graphics and a harder difficulty, but keeping with the theme of our channel, we gotta try out the 2008 version. It really captures the feel of old 2000s games you'd find online. It's charming in a way. The story is well written too, with good dialogue and surprisingly long cutscenes. Plankton is enacting Plan Z version 186. He's stolen the magic pencil from the show and drawn an army of evil doodles to help him take over the world. SpongeBob steals the pencil, but Plankton has already copied its data, so he doesn't really care. He locks you out of the chum bucket with a doodle door lock that can only be opened when four special doodles are erased. They're guarded by SpongeBob's friends who have been brainwashed into defending them. To aid him in his quest, SpongeBob uses the pencil to unleash Doodle Bob from the paper he's trapped in. According to SpongeBob, sticking him in the paper neutralized him and made him a good guy. I'm not sure how that works, but hey, it's a silly cartoony plot, don't think too hard about it. So you get a Mega Man-esque select screen where you choose a friend to go after. Then you head to their stage and move around with your giant pencil as a weapon. You can draw things to jump on and erase evil doodles. The pencil mechanic is really fun to mess around with. This is a very creative concept. Because you can erase your drawings, you'll never get stuck either. So you move through the stages until you reach the boss at the end. Squidward is the boss of his own house and his symbol is a hairpiece. Before every boss fight, Spongebob tells you how his friend will fight you and how you can fight back. It's really convenient. You deflect evil music notes into Squidward by drawing shields to make them bounce back. It's funny to hear him scream about his hair whenever you hit him. My hair! Once you defeat Squidward, you find out he actually wasn't brainwashed and he just wanted you out of his house. So now let's head to Jellyfish Fields to take on Patrick. All the stages are more or less the same deal. You fight jellyfish, evil squidwards, and flying hair pieces. It's a lot of fun regardless. Patrick actually has an interesting boss fight too. You draw yourself a platform to stay out of his reach when he shoots a bubble at you, then he tries to make a giant paint bubble and you have to click it to shrink it down. His dialogue is funny in this context too. Once you shrink the bubble down, it turns into a wrench and hits Patrick in the head. You do this until he's cured. Then you head to Sandy's Tree Dome and repeat the process. Sandy is referred to as the toughest boss in this game, but I actually think Mr. Krabs and Plankton hold that distinction. We'll get to them in a moment. Sandy will stomp around, but you can stay out of her reach if you draw yourself to the top of the screen. Then you erase this barrier and attack her with a robot. Lastly, we head to the Krusty Krab to take on Mr. Krabs. This stage made it hard for me to enact my strategy of riding the pencil like a magic carpet because jellyfish kept flying at me and disrupting my genius plan. Curses, they've thought of everything. Now Mr. Krabs' fight is hard because he bounces around and uses the homing attack from the Sonic games. He's guaranteed to hit you at least a few times. You have to keep the high ground to avoid his ketchup control laser blast, then you drop a flaming burger on him and the dollar controlling him. No! Don't bring me dollars! It's worth winning this boss fight just to hear him blow out your speakers with that whenever you land a hit. Once he's defeated, you can take on Plankton in the Chum Bucket. The Chum Bucket stage is the most complex one with all the twists and turns you have to take. Then you face Plankton. You only have three lives, so this fight can be very anxiety-inducing. It's hard to avoid the lasers he shoots at you because you have to draw a platform at just the right height to avoid the one he shoots on the floor. Drawing shields will not help you against any of his attacks. His attacks are also inconsistent, and he'll often do the same one several times in a row. The worst one is when he floats in the air and fires lasers down at you. If you're in the wrong place, you're guaranteed to be hit. I haven't figured out how to avoid these attacks with certainty, you just have to take the hit and hope you have enough health to endure. When he shoots these missiles, you have to bounce them back at him, but you have to reflect them in just the right spot or they miss. He's very challenging, but it's relieving when you finally beat him. In the final cutscene, you blow up his armor and crush him with a 10-ton anvil. Then you get a tragic final scene where Doodle Bob has to leave because his true home is in the paper. He promises to visit again for holidays before he leaves. Then Plankton swears revenge before being crushed by a 5-ton anvil that came out of nowhere. That concludes Doodle Bob and the Magic Pencil.
Like with the others, this is a very well-made fan game. It's a lot of fun and one I strongly enjoy playing through. Projects like this are a testament to how much love and passion fans can put into their creations. This must have made for a great Christmas present. I applaud the amount of thought and work that went into this. Games like these show just how creative the Spongebob community can be, and it's nice to revisit them and see how much effort developers were willing to put in. But these were all games from when I was growing up. I wonder what Spongebob fan games look like nowadays. Oh, how's rising? Oh no, do you see this in front of us? Uh, well, you can't say they aren't different. They're a heck of a lot less scary than those surgery games, I can tell you that much. Maybe one day they'll be nostalgic enough for me to cover them. So anyway, thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.